Hey guys, it's Hunter. Welcome back to another episode of Ask a Fish, the series where I mysteriously forget that there's guitars for upcoming demos in the background. Weird. I don't know how that keeps happening. Let's just jump straight into your questions. Actually, wait, before we get into it, just a quick reminder, this is the last Ask a Fish before the reverb giveaway closes. If you missed that video, we took a Gibson Fiber Zero and using money, we made it actually good, and we're giving it away. To find out how to enter, link to the video will be in the cards. And with that out of the way, hit that like button, and let's get into it. What about the new Chapman guitars? All right, good start. R.I.P. that dislike ratio. Yeah, I've only done two Chapman videos so far over the course of like two years, the ML2 Pro and Standard. I really like them both, and there's been a lot of requests for me to do more. So Chapman guitars didn't have a huge presence at this year's NAMM show, which truth be told makes a lot of sense. I know a lot of people are like, oh, does this mean they're doing badly? No, Dean and Schechter both had the little private rooms too. The two NAMs I've been to where Chapman Guitars did have a proper booth on the show floor, it was an absolute f***ing disaster. It was impossible. Just chaos. Like even more so than the regular NAM show floor. People just trying to meet YouTubers because you knew if you just hung around long enough, you're gonna eventually run into Rob Scallon. But anyways, the new BIA models, holy crap. There's four of them, two new pros, and for the first time, two standards, which is great news because that makes the design more accessible. Since the originals were announced, I've wanted one so bad. I think it's one of the best modern takes on the classic telly shape. All the new finish names are taken from video games. The pros are inspired by Dark Souls 3. The baritone pro is an ithril burst, which comes from the color of the sky in ithril the boreal valley. The regular pro comes in Karthus burst, named of course after the catacombs of Karthus, which you enter after killing the abyss watchers near the beginning of the game. The standard finishes meanwhile are inspired by Bloodborne. The baritone comes in Pale Blood, a mysterious element from the game. And the regular standard comes in Mensis, named after an enemy called the Brain of Mensis. <laughs> I told Bia if I ended up talking about these, I would pretend at least for a little bit I knew what the f any of this shit was about. Really the only game I've played recently is Master Chief Collection, like two days ago, for the first time forever. Got wrecked. So yeah, the new pro redesigns are so sick. I mean, I don't know if you can call them redesigns since technically the older body design is the same, but the colors, the top woods, the pickups, they're all different from the originals. And the originals were beasts too. Like I played one at Toman and absolutely loved it. So the tops are now, they're calling it Mappa Burl, which is the same as Poplar Burl, I think. It's the trypophobia inducing open hole satin finish top that I was a massive fan of when I saw it first on the high end MIJ Vola Aries a couple years back. It's what I had 10S put on my custom seven string. Now it's on Korean production models. Very cool. And to be clear, it's not just a veneer either. That's a proper five millimeter cap, holes and all. The neck wood has also been changed. One of the things that was really interesting and out of the ordinary about the original Bia Pro is that the bolt-on neck was made of Paduk, which is like a more red-ish wood you don't see on a lot of guitars as the main neck wood. They chose it for stability reasons and it felt really good too. Instead, the neck on the baritone is now three-piece Wenge with an ebony board and the regular scale is three-piece roasted bird's eye maple with a roasted bird's eye maple board. Both with stainless steel frets, I mean, they feel super sick. They don't look too bad either, especially the dark Wenge, my god. The pickups are different too. The originals had Chapman branded pickups. This time, not the case. B has always been partial to the bare knuckles and since his first signature guitars were released, he's also gotten his own signature pickup set, which he's named the Silos. So both the pros have a bare knuckle silo humbucker in the bridge and then a Duncan Little 59 in the neck. That's really interesting. It's not usual for production guitars to have two different aftermarket pickup brands in the same model. Usually, even if an artist likes different pickups from different brands, compromises have to be made. You're a DeMarzi artist or an EMG artist, pick one. I guess with Bare Knuckle, since they're a smaller company, the rules are less stringent, so that's cool. And then the hardware has been changed too. The Baritone has a hip shot hardtail and open gear locking tuners, while the standard has a Schaller vintage trim and locking tuners. And just like the rest of the Pro line, they've got the stainless steel frets, rolled fingerboard edges, the lumen lays, the build quality, everything that I like about my ML2 Pro. I mean, clearly there's a lot of guitar here, but the thing that stuck out to me is that with the different hardware and different neck woods, these aren't just the same guitar with different scale lengths. More than with a lot of other artist models, these feel like a guitarist taking a bass design and really customizing it, running with whatever they thought felt right, rather than trying to play nice with the manufacturer's part partners, if that makes sense. So the pro models are sick, they stole the show from me, but the standards are not bad either. They've basically taken what was best about the BM models of yesteryear and boiled them down to the most important playability and stability features. So the finishes, directly inspired by the originals, as well as by 
Bloodborne, obviously. The colors are a little brighter. I've been told that the prototype is a little too blue, so that it'll be more gray on the production version. Instead of the full flame maple cap, there's a flame maple veneer. I believe it's over a plain maple cap because you can see the natural binding on the side, but I could be wrong. Both have roasted maple necks with rolled edged Makassar ebony fingerboards. Chapman V2 henchman pickups, a low profile string through bridge, and non-locking tuners on both. As much as I like my ML2, which I had initially planned on selling since I had the pro version, but enjoyed it so much I ended up keeping it, these felt even better. And I think that's partially down to the satin finish. I've always said I feel satin makes even more affordable guitars feel higher end. Like as soon as you feel that thick polygloss, you're like, yeah, okay, this guitar is in a certain price range. Rob Scallon signatures have also been given a facelift for 2020. The originals with the natural swamp ash, the idea started with an eight string guitar built for more than just metal and with a finish to match. This year though, they've just gone full metal. It's still got the big ass three piece block of mahogany running through the entire guitar, but now the swamp ash is stained black. And in addition to the six and eight strings, they've added a seven with a Floyd for extra metals. If I'm honest, I never bonded with the look of the original Scallons. I like these a lot more, they're a lot sleeker. Not that my opinion really matters on these because I'm sold on the Bs anyways, but you know, there's my opinion anyways, if anyone cares. In non-signature news, there's the ML1 Pro X, which celebrates Chapman Guitar's 10th anniversary. Again, like with the Bs, popular bro top, but with a more subtle, smoky finish. Then what I'm pretty sure is a satin open pour mahogany body, roasted bird's eye maple neck and fingerboard, Duncan pickups, will continue and bridge with brass saddles. It's even got the original Monkey Lord logo engraved on the truss rod cover to celebrate the 10th anniversary milestone. And production on this guy is limited to just this year. It's kind of weird seeing a Chapman Pro with a flat top instead of a carved top, but you know, you always love to see it. Guitar companies releasing these limited edition runs to celebrate the milestones, be it ESP's 87 series guitars for their 35th anniversary, or Chapman with this for their 10th. I mean, I wouldn't buy it because it's not an ML2, but it's just nice to see. And Chapman did have new ML2s at the show though, specifically they're the ML2Js, presumably J for Junior. So there's two of them, a modern and a traditional. Judging by the price and specs, they'll be standard series level and go for 599 euro each. Mahogany bodies, maple necks, ebony fingerboards. Unlike the regular ML2, these have completely flat tops and wraparound bridges. The modern comes in a deep cherry color with an open pour satin finish and a Chapman Stentorian Zero humbucker, which is the same as the regular one. Then the traditional is in this metallic teal thing with a chrome Chapman P90. Oh my God, they both look so good. And I like how even though it's labeled as traditional, it's still got the lower spoon and tummy cuts as well as the neck heel bevel for comfort. It kind of annoys me when contemporary companies release a traditionally inspired guitar and then proceed to undo all the design progress we've made since the 1950s. Like I understand Gibson and Epiphone do it for legacy reasons, but unless it's part of your history and tradition, there's no real justification for the blocky neck joint to still be a thing. Oh yeah, and even the lefties can get involved with this one. It's available in left-handed and at the same price. I'm not a lefty, so correct me if I'm wrong, but it doesn't seem like that happens very often. But yeah, flat top, double, and single cuts have basically RKO'd the scene. They've come out of nowhere and they're just the thing now. So I am kinda salty though, because these are Toman only exclusives, no US availability. That's it. I'm moving to Germany. Like everyone and their mother are now making flat top single cuts now. And these are some of the more unique takes on the theme. They're definitely inspired, but they're not direct Gibson copies. They've got a different, more contemporary vibe to them. At least that was my take. Plus I love the colors. So that's all the new Chapman stuff, or at least the stuff that we're allowed to talk about. What do you guys think? Personally, I think the Bia Pros are f***ing dope. The baritone in particular, <laughs> the biotone. Not gonna lie though, I didn't bond with the 28 inch scale length. On the Holcomb 7 too, it's just, like it's a short puddle jumper flight from the first to the third fret. But with a guitar that looks that cool and with a neck that comfortable, I might just man up and get over it. Plus, I don't think I've actually demoed a baritone before. And as a fan of the original models, the standard is sweet because it's kind of like that same guitar, but now in my price range, so. I'm down for that too. But yeah, those are my opinions. What's your take and what do you want to see on the channel? Pull in the top right. When are you gonna mod the seven string Hello Kitty? Yeah, I mean, looking at the views that these get compared to everything else, it's clear you guys love these. I love them too, um, so it's definitely in the works. If you don't remember, I bought that seven string Hello Kitty replica thing off AliExpress. It's a really piece of shit. If you haven't seen that, link in the cards. I think I mentioned it before though, the mod projects take a ton of time because there's a lot of moving parts. 
like literally. I have to reach out to all the brands, convince new partners to get involved, so I'm not doing the same thing over and over and over and over. And then of course, organize the time to film and edit in between all the regularly scheduled content as well. Like the general rule is about an hour of editing time per minute of finished video. Both the Evertuned Kitty and the Firebird Zero were like 26 minutes and 40 something seconds. So that's like, 27 hours of pure editing. Jesus Christ, what am I doing with my life? That's why my upload schedule is like one a year or something stupid like that. Hey, baby. But yeah, I'm trying to do more and I'm trying to be quicker with the seven string kitty. It's like one of three currently in the works. Four. I don't know. I need an assistant. I can't keep track of everything. But yeah, uh, I'm working on it. And if you want to make sure you don't miss it, make sure to hit that subscribe button. Did you mention I'm the new Epiphone You didn't mention the new Epiphone 59 Epiphone. You don't mention the 59 Epiphone. It's the closest thing I've ever looked at the Epiphone 59, 59, 59 and I am less hyped. Less God damn, my bad guys. You guys keep me on my toes. Right, so Epiphone is reissuing an accessible version of the Custom Shop 59. And yeah, I didn't mention it in my 2020 Epiphone lineup reaction video. And the reason is, one, I forgot, but also too, part of the reason that I forgot is because it's not listed on the official website yet. We know it's coming, but we also know that it won't be for a while. Like the ones at NAMM were prototypes, not the final production versions. It's kind of the same reason why I didn't mention the Inspired by Gibson Explorers. We know they're coming. We've seen the pictures on the official promo for the series, but those are even further from being a reality than the 59. But yeah, clearly a lot of you guys are as big Les Paul fans as I am. You want to know about the 59 reissue? Let's talk about it. Like, even if you're not a Les Paul aficionado, you've probably heard at least one other guitarist talk about the mythical 59 Les Paul. There's loads of resources online that can go through the lore in much more detail than I can, but suffice it to say, for a lot of players, the 1959 standard is considered by many Les Paul players as the holy grail of guitars. The promised land in mahogany and rosewood form. They were played by Eric Clapton, Dwayne Allman, Billy Gibbons, some dude called Jimmy Page. That list reads like a who's who of game-changing guitar geniuses. The 59 standard was made legendary by the musicians who played it and the music that was written on it. So fast forward to today, a custom shop VOS reissue will run you about 6,000 US. An original, depending on condition, can run you literally hundreds of thousands of dollars. The one that Kirk Hammett owns, he reportedly bought for about $2 million. Although that has some to do with the previous owners, Peter Green and Gary Moore, adding value to that particular guitar. And he actually does play the guitar into work. Can we just take a second and appreciate the level of fuck you money that Kirk Hammett has? Here I am struggling to justify paying four bucks for coffee because I need that money for rent. He's just out there dropping two mil on a guitar because fuck you, he likes it. But yeah, point is, the 59 standard, it's considered the pinnacle of Les Paul dumb, and the price of admission is generally pretty expensive. An Epiphone are like, yeah, nah, fuck that, more people should have this core experience. So, working closely with the custom shop, they're developing a limited edition 59 with the goal of having it as accurate as possible while still being accessible. So it looks like they've taken the inspired by Gibson original 50 standard and made some modifications that make it feel more like the custom shop version. Mahogany body, mahogany neck with the long tenon, maple cap, AAA flame maple veneer. Right, same construction specs as the 50 standard. The two prototypes they showed at NAMM were in Vintage Sunburst and Heritage Cherry Burst, with the 50 standard also comes in, but instead of gloss, these will have the same kind of aged gloss satin finish that's on the Jared James Nichols or Glory. These didn't have rosewood fingerboards as well. The production models will. The plastics have been changed to match the custom shop version. Instead of bevels, like on the regular modern guitars, there's just an edge. I don't know, it's just one of those things that makes a 59 to 59, I guess. The electronics have been modified a little bit with Gibson burst buckers, Mallory capacitors, a switchcraft toggle, and a switchcraft output jack. Just these nice little touches that bring it more in line with the custom shop version. Judging by the rest of the lineup, it'll run you 700, 800 bucks. My favorite reveal at NAMM about this though, It'll come with a pink plush hard shell case. I know, I keep talking about it from my review of the 1955 Les Paul Custom, but honestly, it is just the best. To this day, I just think about it and it puts me in a good mood. So the 59 is cool. Never had a chance to play a real one, obviously. I don't have fuck you money, it's more like fuck me money at the moment. So basically, this was made for players like me, making this experience accessible to broker Les Paul fans. And again, every time I look at the Epiphone lineup now, I start to get a little ahead of myself. I'm also excited for what other collaborations or inspirations Epiphone is going to do with the custom shop now that they're working more closely. I mean, now that they're doing proper Les Paul customs, I'm looking at that 68 reissue. Yeah, what do you think? Are you hyped for the 59? Are there other custom shop reissues that you want to see from Epiphone? Let me know in the comments. 
Do you ever play any video games growing up? If yes, do you find that they help shape your taste in music? Growing up, not really until like high school, especially when I was really young, people would try to bring their N64s over from the US and the voltage was different. So they forget and they tried plugging them into the wall without a transformer and they just explode and you had to import them. They weren't sold there, so we weren't getting a new one anytime soon. The one game that we did get into though was Halo, like the original Combat Evolved. And yeah, that opening theme. I am sure I'm not the only one. As soon as I hear those opening choir notes, it's on. I get goosebumps. And the entire series, or at least the original trilogy, just an incredible soundtrack. Finish the fight from the Halo 3 trailer might be one of the most perfectly epic hype songs ever. Prove me wrong. That got me into orchestral stuff and film soundtrack stuff. When I work, uh, especially writing, I'm not listening to metal. It's either like trance or a film score, which Halo got me into. What about you guys? Any particular games that helped shape your music taste? I'd love to know. And before we get into the last question, I want to give a shout out to Simple Men and the rest of the amazing patrons for supporting what I do and making this content possible. If you like what I do and want to support it, you can join the Patreon community through the link below for bonus perks like MP3s and tabs for all the demo tracks. You can even set monthly limits like a dollar a month. I'm trying to bring on a video editor so I have more time to live. So thank you guys so much for your support. That really helps. And now into the last question. You missed the FR800. You totally skipped over the FR800. Thoughts on the new Ibanez FR800? Probably the best value you, you the one find I wanted in the new to range. Talk about, lol. So I guess this is the Ask a Fish oopsie episode. In my Ibanez lineup reaction video, I missed this one too. And you're right. This was a big miss. I'll be totally honest. There were so many new 2020 models. A lot of ones with really bright colors and me with my attention span. I was drawn to the shiny ones, the more subdued ones, my eyes kind of glossed over. Especially this one, flat black satin finish, blacked out Ibanez logo. I kind of just wrote it off at a glance as probably an entry level model. Yeah, no, turns out not the case. Value wise, this is probably one of the best spec guitars out of the entire lineup. Nyato body, bolt on roasted maple neck, Palfaro fingerboard with 24 jumbo frets. Go to locking tuners. But what's crazy is that this guitar comes with splittable bare knuckle aftermaths. Bare knuckle pickups in a guitar that goes street for about a thousand bucks. I mean, eleven ninety nine, and with the roasted maple neck too. That's nuts. The aftermaths aren't cheap. They're an insane pickup set. Had some free time the other day. Plugged my Axion label RGA sixty one AL in for the first time since I moved to this apartment. The tones are so brutal. The FR800 is kind of like Ibanez's answer to LTD's Black Metal series, blacked out logo and everything. High spec, minimalistic look. I mean, there's a candy apple red matte color as well, but the main emphasis is on the Black Metal competitor. And if six isn't your thing, you're more into sevens, so there's an option for that as well for $11.99. Very decent. No frills, focus on the important stuff, relatively inexpensive for what you're getting. Truth be told, not really into this mutated take on the telly shape, but these specs for the money definitely might be worth checking out. So what do you think about the FR800? Is it one of the most interesting to you in the lineup, or should I focus on the more shiny things? Let me know in the comments. And that'll do it for this week's episode of Ask a Fish. If you enjoyed the video, do me a favor and hit the like button, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. That way you don't miss any new uploads. Feel free to leave your thoughts on anything discussed or your questions for future episodes in the comments. As always, thanks so much for watching. You've been awesome, and I'll see you for the next video.